intractable conflicts. We are told they exist in the world and we must accept their reality. I beg to differ. Peace in the Middle East. When I hear these words, I don't know whether to cry or laugh. But I do know one thing for sure. The key to peace in the Middle East is the returning home of displaced Palestinians, whether they're refugees, exiles, or diaspora. For many around the world, Palestinian refugees symbolize the long-standing conflict between Israelis and Palestinians. For Israelis, they have responded by burying their heads in the sand, pretending the issue does not exist. For Palestinians, refugees are the issue. For the world, refugees are the stubborn, still-beating heart of what some call an intractable conflict. We have all experienced having to leave in a hurry for a business or luxury trip, the rush to pack your luggage, picking the right clothes for two days, enough clean underwear, a good book, and at the last minute forgetting your favorite toothbrush. What if your two-day trip turned out to be four? You'd probably manage. Thank God for that book. You'd probably manage even for a week. How about delayed for one month, 10 months, 10 years, over 60 years? Now imagine your hastily planned trip was not a pre-planned trip at all, but an abrupt necessity to flee for the safety of you and your family. No taxi or bus to drive you to the airport. No time to plan. No space for the kids' toys. No space for the kids' clothes. You'd flee on foot, maybe now carrying the useless house key. Such an extreme exodus happened to thousands of peaceful Palestinians over six decades ago. They and their descendants now number in the millions. What should we call them? Forced, homeless, displaced, diaspora, 1948ers? But they were there long before 1948. What terms would convey the horror, suffering, and injustice inflicted on such refugees? For many, the word refugee is an obscure, bloodless term used in census surveys. To Palestinians, however, the term is surgically painful, something that to this day stabs at our hearts. As an example, let me share with you the opening account of a book of oral histories titled Homeland. The account is from an elderly man named Muhammad Brahim Harb a Palestinian refugee from 1948. We recorded his words in August 1991, deep in a refugee camp in the Gaza Strip where he lives with his extended family. Muhammad told us, I was born in Hamama, north of Askelan. The name of the town means peace dove. In 1948, I took my mother, wife, brother, and sister to the Jabalia refugee camp in the Gaza Strip. My, my, my father remained in Hamama to watch over the house. When I returned to get my father, he was, the door was broken down and he was bayoneted on the right side. He had been dead for two or three days when I found him. A kitten was eating from his body. I buried him in a shallow grave and fled during the night. I took nothing from our home, not even our land certificates. I rode a donkey back to Gaza and told my mother. What if you found your father in such conditions? What horrors would be seared in your memory. 
Can you imagine the broken heart Muhammad had to carry for his entire life? Now imagine an entire people who not only experience similarly horrific events, but are told by an indifferent world to get over it. A world sometimes that denies they suffered at all. My name is Sam Bahor. I was born and raised in Youngstown, Ohio. Today, I live in my father's birthplace of Albire, eight miles north of Jerusalem, deep in the West Bank. Our home was my grandfather's home too. It was also the home of his grandfather's. My wife, Abir, and two daughters, Irene and Nadine, share a yard with me that is filled with fruit trees. Though we are literally only a three minute walk from downtown Ramallah, our commercial center. On the other hand, our view from our bedroom window is less idyllic. It shows one of the numerous eyesores across West Bank mountaintops, an illegal Israeli settlement. As a business consultant, I advise clients on specific issues to take in their businesses to solve their problems. Often, reframing of issues can alter seemingly intractable realities. I believe similar reframing can bring peace to the Holy Land, everybody's Holy Land. Israel currently controls all access to the West Bank. My father, who left, for pa left Palestine for the United States 10 years before the 1967 day war, therefore he was not counted in the census that Israel took when it first seized control. Palestinians who were present received an Israeli-issued identification card, giving them permanent residency in their ancestral homes. To this day, my 71-year-old West Bank-born father can return to his birthplace only as a U.S. tourist and for a maximum of three months, after which he has his heart broken to return to Ohio to wait another year before he can see his granddaughters, his only two granddaughters. Meanwhile, a Jewish person born in Brooklyn, Bolivia, or Bulgaria has the full right to be a full citizen the moment he or she lands in Israel. As an American, I entered Israel, Palestine, the same way as my father, as a temporary tourist. Lack of permanent residency meant I had to leave and re-enter every few months to renew my visa. That outrage continued for a decade and a half. My wife and I were never sure whether to buy a new car or not buy a new home or not, pay the girls as full tuition or not. One cannot build a future on three-month planning horizons. Our occupiers know this very well. In 2006, during a visa renewal trip to Jordan, I was given, after a six-hour wait, a tourist visa. This time, however, my U.S. passport had handwritten in it in Hebrew, Arabic, and English, last permit. I joined the campaign for the right to enter. I also reached out to many Israeli friends to make my case for permanent residency. The Israeli military finally conceded in 2009. Or did they? As a U.S. citizen who traveled freely for 15 years, I was now classified as a Palestinian, more so than my father who was born here. That meant my Israeli-issued ID card cost me my freedom. Today I can visit Jerusalem only after getting an Israeli military permit, and even then by first traveling on foot through a humiliating checkpoint 
resembling a cattle suit. Still, I am one of the lucky ones. Many of the photos of refugees you are about to see on the screen behind me were taken during the past few years by Alaa Saadi and Nadia Hassan. Alaa, from Syria, a refugee, is prohibited by Israel from entering Palestine. Nadia, a foreign-born citizen like me, but from Chile, has been denied entry five times so far. When I tally the time, money, and effort Palestinians spend just to exist, I don't know whether to laugh or cry. But I do know the returning of displaced Palestinians to their homes is key for peace in the Middle East. My father recalls when he was a child, back in 1948, and thousands of Palestinians had to flee from their homes in what today is Israel. My father said this in his account in our oral history book. And I remember a lot of people came and lived in the field next to our home. These people were Palestinian refugees of 1948. I didn't know that at the time. I didn't know where these people were coming from. Somebody was chasing somebody. I remember taking food to these people. My grandmother gave me bread, and my mother gave me other things. I took the food to the people in the field and just gave it to them. I can close my eyes and see the people in the field, the kids crying. I was eight or nine years old. Witnessing such human tragedy breaks hearts for a lifetime. My father is still haunted by this experience today, yet the world selectively empathizes with human tragedy. What was supposed to be a temporary phenomena became permanent, Palestinian refugees, young and old, male and female, healthy and sick, all are now regulated by a UN bureaucracy. For those in the West, this is convenient. As long as someone else is dealing with the matter, consciousness could be clear. And the people who drove the refugees from their land have the freedom to create endless new facts on the ground, 64 years and counting. Today, Palestinian refugees and displaced persons have never been allowed the choice to return to their homes nor given redress for their losses. The continued denial of their rights encapsulates decades-long struggle, disenfranchisement, and dispossession. Yearning to go home, yearning to reclaim their full identity, the refugees continue to live a shattered life. Their hands tell a story of hardship. Their faces wrinkled but miraculously remain full of dignity. Some of these refugees have been displaced two and three times. Some transported as far away as Chile in South America. Refugees see a world that doesn't care. They see an international community obsessed with the next electronic gadget instead of application of law. They see nations mobilized during natural disasters, remaining indifferent to man-made calamities. How tragic that only some types of human suffering are considered tragedies. Hopes were ignited in the 1990s that the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian West Bank and Gaza Strip would end, and the plight of refugees would finally be resolved. That was nearly two decades ago. Israel's first prime minister said, the old will die and the young will forget. We have not forgotten. More recently, Israel's last prime minister explicitly stated, the Palestinians must relinquish your demand for the realization of the right of return. One does not relinquish one's own being. Allowing someone to return home is not a threat to security. In fact, it is quite the opposite. Reconciling historic injustices 
is the only way to true security. In the meantime, we must document. It is imperative that we seek out writers, poets, filmmakers, artists, and historians who put to paper, screen, and stage the reality of a people who never gave up despite colossal odds. In closing, I want to quote something passed to me by an Israeli friend of mine in Jerusalem. Ukrainian Rabbi Nachman, a Jewish sage from the 18th century, once said, there is nothing more whole than a broken heart. Well, my friends, our heart, our collective Palestinian heart, will never be fuller than it is today. And our heart is telling us there are no intractable conflicts, only intractable minds refusing the will of humanity. Peace in the Middle East is not a video game or a sport. Peace can, must, and will come. The sooner, the better. Because there is no need for any side to cry again. But key to peace in the Middle East is the returning home of displaced Palestinians, whether they're refugees, exiles, or the diaspora. Thank you.